the lessons of the Holocaust and genocide more broadly to schools, the public, and various other interested audiences. Tonight, we are proudly hosting our first HGRP event about the death marches. The HGRP, or the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership, is a consortium of four research partners, of which we are one, along with Wiener Holocaust Library, Royal Holloway, the University of London, and the University of Huddersfield. The goal of this partnership is to bring together public engagement, education, and heritage practice about the history and memory of the Holocaust and genocide. Our first HGRP exhibition, which is currently on display at the Wiener Holocaust Library in London and at the Centre in Huddersfield, is about the death marches. Based on the research of Wiener Library's Dr. Christine Schmidt and Royal, Holloway, Royal Holloway's Professor Dan Stone, this exhibition looks at the forced marches of hundreds of thousands of individuals who were evacuated in terrible conditions and under heavy guard. By exploring how evidence has been collected since the end of the Holocaust, this exhibition brings new insights to issues of confrontation, justice, and memory. Tonight's event features the stories of two Holocaust survivors and their own experiences of the death marches. Before I introduce them, though, I should mention a few housekeeping items. First, our fabulous visitor operations manager, Alex Joseph, will help with the technical side of things this evening. We'll ask that you please save all your questions until the end and please put them through the chat function. We will also record this talk tonight and tomorrow you will receive a link for this along with a short online survey. We want to make this event the best that they can be. So please let us know what you think. Also, we are a charity and you're supporting us by simply attending this evening. Of course, if you want to go further, I will invite you to do so in two key ways. First, you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, we're everywhere. We also have monthly newsletters so you can keep up to date with our work and events and tell all of your friends. And you can also consider making a donation to us. As a charity, every penny counts. You can donate by visiting our website and either clicking on the given help in the top right hand corner or by going to the bottom of our homepage. We also host various events, all remotely at present, uh, about experiences, commemorations, and leading research about genocide and the Holocaust. Feel free to check out our events page for more details. And finally, I should tell you to COVID permitting our center in Huddersfield will be open for one day per week from the 1st of June. So if you're in the area, please come visit us and you can see this fascinating new Death Marches exhibition. So I will now get down to business. Tonight's event features the stories of Ibby Nell and Truda Silman. They will be joined by our head of collections, Tracy Craigs, Dr. Tracy Craigs. Tracy is an oral historian, as well as our remarkable community support officer. And she has worked closely with Ibby and Trudy to collect their testimonies and even prepare their PowerPoints. Our special, very special thanks to Tracy for her efforts this evening. Our first speaker is Ibi Nil. Ibi was born in Czechoslovakia in 1923 and lived in Bratislava there as a child. In 1942, the age of 19, Ibi fled to Hungary to stay with family. She joined the Hungarian resistance, but was imprisoned. There she learned basic first aid and worked as a nurse. She also spoke a number of languages. She still speaks six different languages today. Seven. Uh, seven. <gasps> Seven, 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 she says with pride. After her brief release in February of 1944, she was rounded up and deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau in June of 1944. There she also worked as a volunteer nurse, but in March 1945, the hospital unit was evacuated. Ibi was first sent to Lipstadt for a time, then force marched towards Bergen-Belsen. She credits her friends who carried her along the way for her survival. She was liberated on the death march on Easter Sunday in 1945. After the war, Ibi worked as a translator for the Allied military government, where she met Bert Nil, a British officer. They were married in 1946, and Ibi moved to England in 1947, where she worked for in a number of different professions before starting and running a translation company for over 30 years. She has two stepsons, one son, a daughter, and three grandchildren. We are delighted you were able to join us tonight, Ibi. Tonight, we're also joined by Truda Silman. 
Trudy was born in 1929 in Bratislava, then Czechoslovakia. As the persecution of Jews increased, Trudy and her siblings were each sent to England. Trudy's older sister was sent in December of 1938, while Trudy made the voyage to England in late March 1939. Trudy was only nine years old, and she remembers going from Vienna to Cologne to Holland to Harwich, then on to London. Just two months later, in May 1939, her older brother Paul also relocated to London. Trudy was placed in a number of different foster families across the country, but did not speak very much English at that time. Although she kept in touch with her siblings and even her parents back in Europe, Trudy remembers being very homesick. She stayed with various host families, with schools, with family relations throughout the war, and was eventually sent to the north of Cornwall where she spent the rest of the war. After the war, Trudy studied biochemistry at Leeds University. She met her husband, Norman Silman, and married in 1948, having two children. Trudy had a very career in research before becoming a college lecturer. Trudy has five grandchildren. Tonight, we welcome Ibby and Trudy. Thank you for sharing your stories with us tonight. Tracy, I will now hand it over to you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sitting near Ibby. Um, and I'd like to invite Ibby to start. Uh, Ibby's going to do a, a 20 minute presentation, but then we're going to hand over to Trudy. So can we have the first slide for Ibby, please? That, that, that one was taken when I was about two years old in Kosice, where I was born. I sp spent my first years in Kosice. When I was five, we moved to Bratislava. Um, the next slide. Next slide. My father was an area manager for the Assicurazione Generale, the insurance, main insurance company in, in Europe. And my mother was a businesswoman who took over the running of my grandfather's engineering business when they moved to Bratislava. That's a photo of father, mother, me, and my brother, who was born in 1929. Next slide. Next slide. This is a picture of our family. Holiday in Carlo Vari Carlsbad. Father with a cigar in his hand. Mother's mother, grandmother behind it. My brother, look what horrible things they put little boys in. Then cousin, mother's cousin Edith, who married a, a British architect in Israel and came to live in England too. The pudding basin in me, the elegant lady's mother, and the chap there had nothing to do with us. He just happened to walk past us. Next slide. Next slide. Well, we had certainly nothing in my youth which had prepared me for what was to follow. In 1942, when the Germans had occupied Czechoslovakia, I escaped to Hungary. And Germany, although Hungary was an ally of Germany, the Germans occupied it in 1944. And in the beginning of 1944, I found myself in a brickyard in Székesfehérvár. And because all the Patients from the hospital who were Jewish had also been evacuated there. I volunteered to help with them because many of the doctors and nurses wanted to be with their families. And in 1944, beginning of 1944, a wagon train was pulled up and we were pushed into the wagon train and taken to Auschwitz Birkenau. In, I was in the wagon with me, there were two doctors, a nurse, a dental technician, and I, and we befriended each other and decided to stick together, and we did all the way to the end. So this is the entrance to Auschwitz-Birkenau. When we arrived there, men in striped pajamas pulled open the gate doors of the cattle buses, and as we said, told us to leave the old, the sick, and the children to jump out, men to the right, women to the left, make go into rooms of four, five, and march forward. And the five of us were told we stayed together all the way through to this one. 
marcha para o Dr. Menger e os outros atividades em venta sobre gay kicks e arbitragem. Der Bereich in Auschwitz-Birkenau begann in 1944. Und er war da für 40 Tage und 40 Nächte. In the beginning of July, they were getting people to go with the labor transport to work. And they were looking for doctors and nurses. And I stepped forward and my four friends with me. And we went forward. And in July 1944, we were taken by the wagon to Aus to Lipstadt, which was a slave labor camp. Because I spoke fluent German, I was asked to set up a Riviera field hospital. And we are working with very basic, basic, basic bandages were made of gray paper, and except for aspirin and tannin, we had no other medication. But it's quite surprising that in spite of having an epidemic of typhoid there, we only had eight deaths there. In the, um, the supply of iron was getting less and less with the Allies advancing, and the factory when they couldn't work just closed down. And by the beginning of March, the factory closed down completely, and the wagon train arrived, and we were told to put all the patients into the wagon train. They would be taken to Berlin Belsen. The rest of us would have to march there. So we had one problem. Three women from Hungary that had been pregnant and gave, us, gave birth actually to healthy babies there. We didn't think that they would be able to march with the baby, suckling the babies. So the commandant told us to put them just into the wagon. They would also be created to bear the bells. So we did. And one of them put her baby near the door, trying to get it fresh air. And when they had all the babies, all the people in the van, and they got a list of them, then the soldier pulled himself up and accidentally or on purpose stepped on the baby and killed it outright. You can imagine the response of the mother. But he turned to me and said, tell the woman I probably saved her life because if she with the baby arrived in Bergen Belsen, they were going straight in the gas chamber. As it is, she has a chance to survive. Sometimes, a couple of years after the end of the war, I found out that she had survived, as had her husband, and they had emigrated to Australia. So the wagon train went off, and they started to march us. And they marched us during the night so the Germans shouldn't see what was happening and hit us in barns during the daytime. Now, while we were in Birkenau, I got hit over my left hip by the rifle of a, by a German soldier, and it just meant that my left leg was weak and has been weak ever since. So what, when we were walking, if anybody lagged behind, they were lagged behind, a soldier stayed behind, you heard some shots, a soldier came back, but the other people didn't. And that happened every night, several times. As I told you, I couldn't walk very well, so the four of us, four of my friends supported me and dragged me along because they didn't want me to be left behind. We came, after some, about a week's war marching, we came to a village called Kaunitz, and there were no barns to hide us there. So there was a freshly plowed field, and they told us to lie down in the field and the soldiers lay down in the ditch and edged their way towards the wood that was behind them. And overhead, we could see planes with the American insignia. And then along the main road, besides the field, a row of tanks came, covered with pink paper to, so that the planes could identify them. And they stopped in front of the field. And hundreds of women in rags jumped out and surrounded them. I don't know who was most surprised, the American were us. They told us they were the advanced troops, that they were staying there, that permanent soldiers would be there in a few days. But in the meantime, we should just go and house ourselves on wherever we could and take whatever we needed. 
So my friends dragged me to a farmhouse that was nearby. They put me on a wooden settle. And the doctor said, whatever you do, don't eat butter or, or rich food of any kind, because our stomachs had been scoured with a quart of food that we've been eating. eating. In the center of the table, of the room, there was a table. There was an elderly man, a woman, the little girl sitting there. And the little girl went, bent and whispered something to her mother. And she reached out to the table and there was a bowl with eggs in there. And she picked up an egg and she came to me and she offered me an egg. And that is why I could understand why they had her church bells ringing. She said, it's Easter Sunday. Now, every day is nice to be liberated on, but Easter Sunday is rather special. I was taken to a hospital in Bielefeld, but they couldn't do a lot about my legs. They just got some painkillers for me. And then Kaunitz became a displaced person camp because besides us, there was also a Russian prisoner of war camp got liberated there. No, I had no wish to go home because I didn't think that any of my family could possibly have survived. So using my languages, I went and worked for the British Army of the Rhine, the military government, actually the 1027 military government detachment in Buren. We have a photograph, Vivi. Would you like to move yes. the PowerPoint on for us, please, Alex? And that was when we registered in Auschwitz-Birkenau. This is when we were liberated. When we were registered, we had the first form was filled with all details of us, and we were tattooed. But they ran out of ink when it came to me, so they just pushed me through without the tattooing. So I became known as the woman without a number. And this is a photo that the Americans took of us. They pushed us into a school. And there were 700 of us. I'm somewhere in there, but there's no way I can enlarge it anymore or identify myself in there, but I'm somewhere there. The next slide, please. Next slide. This is me now working with the military government. This photo was taken in August 1945. Next one. Next one, please. Next one, please. This is me with my official car, my driver, two of my clerks, and my dog. Always had dogs. The next one. Next one. I, then one of the military, in the military government was also Major Neville. Mm -hmm. And he was a widow of his two sons. And he just, decided to get married, but the army wouldn't allow it because they said it was a marriage of convenience. And Bert said, convenience who for? He was twice my age. So in September 1945, I went back to Bratislava. My mother had returned from, from Auschwitz, Birkenau, and my brother and my cousin who had been hidden in, Germany, in Hungary had also come back. But my father had got gas on the last occasion and they used the gas chamber in auschwitz Birkenau on the 31st of October, 1944. The following days, the Russian occupied auschwitz Birkenau. Next slide. In, and I say I went back to, in September 1945, I went back home. No, go back. Bert came down and we got married on the 3rd of December 1946. And I came to England the beginning of March 1947 and then lived ever since. Next slide. I had lots of jobs in England. One of the things was this is me here in a sea of gray. This is at the home of the Civil Defense Staff College in Easingwold. I was the only woman there, as you can see, in a sale of males. And I worked for Civil Defense 
of Phoenix Dissolution in 1970s, then I transferred to the Department of Education. And I became a principal officer in charge of students' grants and awards and educational charities. And I worked there until 1958. Then I, was, I had a recurrence of cancer, and I was given two years to live. So I took early retirement on health ground. In 1958, I was given two years to live. And here I'm in 2021, still living on my disabled and pension. Next slide. Is there another one? Yeah. Two more. No. I was one of the first, first cohort to open university to get a degree. And, and that was when I had my master's degree at from Leeds University, a master's in theology. And this was given to me by the Archbishop of York in York Minster. And that's my daughter and two of my grandchildren there with me. Next slide. And besides the masters, I got an honorary doctorate from Huddersfield University. I'm a fellow of Trinity University. And about three years ago, I got the BEM by the Lord Lieutenant on behalf of the Queen. And she and I have been in, con in con continuous contact ever since. Thank you very much, Ibby. And I'd like to hand over to Trudy now uh, for Trudy to talk us through her PowerPoint. Hello, Trudy. Hello, good evening. Yeah. Are we all set to go? We are, please, Trudy. Right. Well, uh, I would like to start with my slideshow, please. Perfect. Alex is just getting it on screen. Right. Scrambling in the background. Um, my, my story is totally different because I'm going to try and focus on the story of my mother because I am not a well, I'm a refugee rather than a Holocaust survivor in the strict sense. But my story of my mother is the one that is incomplete because I am still looking for her. So you've got a picture of my mother in front of you. And if we now go to the first slide, please. Now, this is in uh, Slovakia now. It used to be in the Austria-Hungarian Empire and in those days the place was called Tuchyansky Svati Martin and this is the house in the middle of the uh, uh, picture which shows where my mother was born and where her parents had their house and also their business because they owned a large ironmongery uh, shop. And if we go to the next one, please. Uh, mother had a good upbringing and had a good education. And these are her parents or my grandparents, my grandmother and grandfather. And grandmother actually ran the show. She had had a very good education and was one of the earliest people to receive a degree. And she'd been born in the 1860s. Next one, please. Next slide, please. These are my parents, my father and mother. And um, a father was born in 1887 and he served in the uh, army as a lieutenant during the war. And very soon after the war, he and my mother were married and set up home. And uh, I had an elder brother, seven years older than me and a sister. So can we please have the next one, please? 
This is the first home where my parents lived and uh, I was born there in 1929. And we then moved in 1934 to a more modern house. So can we please see that next slide, please? And this is a photograph taken quite a few years later, in fact, uh, uh, in about 2020. And one of the houses to the right at the back in the dark gray is the newly built house where we lived on the third floor in a flat. And at the very corner of the right hand side, you see a modern building, which is uh, the Crown Plaza Hotel in Bratislava today. And um, uh, that was the place actually where my grandparents' house stood. So as you can see, we live very nearby. And at the very top of the hill is the castle, which was actually a ruin. And it has now been turned into a museum with that beautiful red roof. Next, please. Now, I'm going to talk to you about my mother a little more. The first uh, picture on the right with her sister is before she was married. And this is her sister, Gitta, who is her youngest sister. To the right, my mother is with her mother somewhere in Bratislava. Next, please. And now there's quite a lot of history between that first photograph of my mother and uh, this photograph, because of course I haven't got a full set of photographs. In between that, uh, rather a catastrophe happened. I was born in April, 1929, but as most of you may realize, we had the Wall Street crash in 1929. And after the end of the First World War, my father and a friend started a bank. Unfortunately, the bank wasn't strong enough to live through the terrible crash which happened in late 1929. And in fact, we became an impoverished family. But we were very lucky because my mother's parents were able to retain most of their wealth, so to speak, and were able to support us whenever we needed anything. So in fact, the photograph you've got in front of you is a holiday snap taken when my grandparents took us to Austria to Badgastein. And you can see grandpa with his fantastic moustache, my father at the far end, grandma next to grandpa, and I'm squeezed between her and my mother. My brother Paul, who was seven years older than me, and sister Charlotte, and finally my father. And one interesting point, both gentlemen are using sticks neither of whom needed a stick, but it was something which all well-dressed gentlemen used in those days. And between this photograph and most other things, I had a very happy childhood. I was never aware of any of the shortcomings. We used to go swimming, we used to go for walks, and all the rest of it. But as we're talking about mother, I would like us now to move on to the next photograph, please. Next one, please. Well, this shows you again a photograph of which I've got of my mother to the left, my mother in the dark coat and our nanny in the light coat, my brother in his sailor suit, sister Charlotte, and myself 
as we're just having a walk probably near the Danube in Bratislava, where I was born. To the right, another holiday snap. This time, we are with my father, and we're again in Austria, in Neustadt am See, and we've all been swimming. So there you are, just nice family photographs. There's my sister and my soul. Now the next one, please. And another holiday snap. This time we're in Yugoslavia and having a wonderful holiday in a place called Zvikvenica, which is very far up in the north of what was then Yugoslavia. Next one, please. Now, when we come to this uh, photograph on the right, that's still an early one. But the one on the left, where my mother is with my father, is already taken uh, after I had left home in 1939. And I think uh, I would just like to mention that I have no recollection of actually traveling from home because my mother only told me the night before that I was leaving to England on the following morning and I was going to travel with an aunt and my cousin. But all the time I was at home, the 10 years from 1929 to 39, I had a happy childhood and I enjoyed doing all sorts of things with my mother. I used to love going to the market with her to do the shopping. His mother was an excellent cook. She had an excellent education. She spoke French, a certain amount of English, and uh, she was uh, a very good mum. And every afternoon she would meet with her sisters. And she had uh, two elder sisters, one younger sister, and a brother. And she would meet with her sisters virtually every day and they would have a good chat, and then uh, they would also visit their mother. And everything was very nearby within walking distance, because Bratislava is not a very large town, at least it wasn't then, and uh, the Jewish people tended to live in one area, and it was quite easy to walk from one aunt's house to another's, to my grandmother's, to the cafe house, and even to do the shopping in the market. And uh, I had an interesting large class. There were 56 people in my class. I was happy at school. And basically, I could really just describe a very happy life. Well, now, unfortunately, to the tragedy of that befell my family, very briefly, my father was one of the very earliest people to be taken away, and he died in Auschwitz within three weeks of arrival. All of this I have got on documentation. However, mother was a problem for me. I did have two or three Red Cross letters throughout the next few years. But basically, the story goes a little like this. Mother actually moved across into my grandmother's home because she was already ailing and needed help. And I think that is one of the reasons why my father was taken away early, because he was left on his own. Mother uh, continued to look after her own mother. And I think grandmother must have been taken away very early as well in 1942. Now, it was much better, or there was a greater chance of being able to uh, not be removed, was to be married. So in fact, my mother marries an old family friend of her parents and he is 25 years older than she is. 
that he has already been baptized into the evangelical church. The reason for this being the, the church uh, that they should have chosen would have been the Catholic church, but the Catholic church was no longer doing any of these, uh, uh, how to call it, to turn people into the different religion. So both her second husband and she became evangelical Christians. Now, because he was already so much older than mother, and mother had been born in 1899, so she was already well into her 40s, and he must have been well into his 60s. He was ailing. And uh, they managed to cling on till 19, December 1944 for which I have the documentation that they were transported to a very small concentration camp outside Bratislava called Sered. Now, very few of uh, people are aware of anything except for Auschwitz and places like that, but there were thousands of other small places where they were concentration camps and mother was taken to Sered with her then present husband. Well, he is already documented dead within a week of having arrived at Sered. But unfortunately, I was not able to find anything to do with mother. And I then started looking, and for many, many years, I corresponded with various cousins who had survived, although not very many of them. And uh, we never were able to find anything. But um, I see that we've got another picture come up, which just only indicates that I had in the meantime come to England because I had came to England in uh, April 1939, and my brother and sister also eventually ended up in England. But as this is the story of my mother, I would really like to go back uh, further down into my photographs, please. Uh, right. Well, we're in Sered, and uh, eventually I went for a, a visit back to Bratislava. And this is what the Sered concentration camp looked like when I visited at the beginning of around about 2004. And I'm being shown around by the director of what uh, then has to become the Holocaust Museum outside Bratislava. And uh, I, I must say that they've done a fantastic job. And if anybody's ever in Bratislava, I would recommend you try and have the time to have a look at it. And um, the other thing which is very important to me is that they have actually honored my mother and when we go a little further, we can see some of the new exhibition, which is now available when we become unlocked again in uh, Slovakia near Bratislava. So can I have the next picture, please? But this shows you the old picture when I visited in about 2009. And the house with the roof is where the commandant lived. And the square in front was the Appel Plus, where they would have the prisoners out twice a day. But later on, this area became um, a sort of uh, like a graveyard because they had a lot of people buried in that area. So can I have the next slide, please? 
So this uh, now shows part of uh, the inside of the new museum, which has been er erected in Seret. And I was amazed they had actually selected the story of my mother as one of the major exhibits. And as you can see, there is quite a large screen, most of which is in Slovak, which actually shows that this has been uh, the story of my mother, and it has uh, really made the most beautiful showing in the museum, which I was very proud of and happy to see, so that people can know that we are still looking for people who were lost and buried or just shot en route on these death marches. Now, the part of the story which I haven't told you, which is quite a long story, is how long it took me to try and find all this out. Eventually, I found out that there were five transports from the um, Sered, and four of them are completely documented. But the fifth one, there was no documentation found. And I'm very sure in my own mind that she would have been on this one. And I followed this particular uh, death march, which for which there wasn't any sort of literature to, to say. And eventually this thing traveled for five months through the harshest winter that we had for many, many years. And they kept on going to a variety of places, but the places you will recognize, one of them was Sachsenhausen. And Sachsenhausen is miles and miles away in North Germany. So throughout the winter, they will have walked. And if she arrived in Sachsenhausen, it would have been sometime in January or February even, um, in 45. And assuming that she had survived, and I think she may have survived to Sachsenhausen, certainly, because during my searches, I found a piece of paper which completely described my mother, but uh, it didn't give her name. But it did say that she was a nurse, which uh, was correct. She had been nursing after her mother died. And her, the things just fitted, but I am not 100% sure. Anyway, I continued to find out where this particular death march went. And it kept on marching backwards and forwards because the people who were running the march had no idea where they were going anymore. Things were at sixes and sevens in Europe. But eventually, this ends up in Volar, which is right at the tip of Bohemia, where it joins Germany and Austria. And they had been walking all the time since December uh, to really arrive down there. But there is something very unusual about this particular death march. It is a death march, which is the only one virtually completely of women. There was one man there, and otherwise they had women guards and a few army personnel who were looking after this particular death march. But with the confusion of the fighting and the withdrawal of the Germans into Germany, they weren't receiving proper instructions. And they meandered around backwards and forwards till they ended up right in the south of Czechoslovakia, in fact, in a place called Volanje. And by the time they got to Volari, they had many, many of the people who started 
had died of disease, had been shot because they weren't able to keep up. And they kept on replacing other people into this march. But eventually, they were only, I think, about, I don't know, possibly about 90 people at the most left from the, about 1,500 or 2,000 people who had been on this march. And uh, the amazing thing is that the people they arrested, again, some of them unfortunately didn't survive because uh, I think they ate a little bit too much. But of the few people that uh, survived, some of them then helped to uh, put up storage and uh, get all the records there. And there is now this wonderful museum available in Sarev, with whom we do work when we can. Now, can I have the next one, please? Now, this actually comes back again to the death march, because this is the only cemetery where there are only women uh, who are buried. And I think it's so beautiful that I would like you to have a look at it. At the back of this, you can see the special um, sort of statue they've put up to uh, commemorate all these women. And the little photograph to the right actually shows the, uh, the gentleman is a distant relation of the Solman family. And the lady on the right, I think, had actually survived the camps, and she was looking after this beautiful uh, graveyard where they have put up specific stones. I don't know whether we can go back one, uh, Tracy, whether we still have one. No, there isn't one in between. No, but I think that basically shows my my slides. Uh, and I think there are another four, or they're coming the other, they're coming around the other way. I think you can now see it much more clearly. The little statue is actually the commemoration. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one on the top on the right hand side shows a tombstone which says a uh, name unknown and from a long, long time. I actually thought that this could have been my mother's, but um, I'm glad I didn't have it dug up because it wasn't my mother's, because I eventually found up that it was an other lady with a very similar name. I'm not the time. Another slide. And I think there's just one more slide to go, Tracy. Is that correct? That's it, the one where you thought your mother was there. Yes, yes this Ashton. is the one. And I think you get a better view of the beautiful uh, cemetery which they have made for these particular women down in the very uh, southern tip of Bohemia. It's very difficult to get at, but it is a lovely place and is of great memory to me. And I'm still hopeful that now that uh, the records have been opened up and more research is being done on the death marches, that we will be able to find out possibly a little more. But I'm not all that hopeful anymore. Thank you, Trudy, very much for that talk. It was uh, very enlightening um, and we're very, very grateful. Um, I'm going to ask Chelsea to ask some questions for us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So over to you, Chelsea. Thank you, Tracy. Yes. Thank you, Ibby and Trudy. I'm, I'm going to invite anybody that wants to ask a question to please do so in the chat function. But to just start things off, I'm going to ask Ibby uh, a question about friendship. Ibby, when you were talking about the death marches, um, you spoke about your friends, the ladies around you, who helped you, and you sort of all stuck together. C could you talk a little bit more about 
that particular experience. When the elderly doctor finished up in the BB Liffield Hospital, Disney, and she actually died not much later because she had cancer. The other one went back to Bratislava, went back into surgery, and eventually emigrated to Israel. I hadn't been able to trace the other two. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just ask another. I'll just ask another selfish question, uh, and this one also is for Ibi, and then I've got one for Trudy as well. Um, Ibi, when it comes to your languages, you spoke so many languages and still do. Do you think that your ability to speak these languages was a key to your survival? We'll unmute her, Tracy. Oh, she was unmuted and then went there. She Sorry. Went. Sorry. Can you say that again for us? That's my fault. I've muted her. I went to German language schools and I, I spoke, speak, I spoke, I still speak Hochdeutsch, like the officers speak. And the German soldiers used to jump to attention when they heard me because they couldn't believe that somebody would, who wasn't an officer could talk like this. So, and English, my father had a cousin who was married in England and I actually was on the point of leaving to go to England when the war started. To go, I was enrolled to go to Rodian. So I spoke fluent English from the word go. And I had Czech and Slovak and Hungarian because my father was Hungarian. And we did Russian at school as well and French. And I'd, I've forgotten my Russian, but I got Norwegian because my son lives in Norway where my husband's original family come from. So languages help always. My goodness, you're the United Nations of languages. That's incredible, truly. Thank you, Ibby. Trudy, I have a question for you with regards to the letters that you received from your mother, if I understand this. During the war, when you were a little girl in England, you received Red Cross letters that were only 25 words of, allowed to be written in these letters. Can you tell us a little bit more about what was said in those letters? Before I answer that, can I answer a little bit about languages? Of course, please. Oh my goodness, yeah, yes, absolutely. Tell us about your experience with languages, but, yes. But, but pure chance, Ibi and I lived within several hundred yards of each other. We both come from Bratislava. I even ended up in this same class as her brother. But our class sizes were in the range of 50s to 60. And I did not know Ibi's brother. Now that's number one. Number two, languages. We both come from the tip where Hungary, Austria meet, and yet we come from Czechoslovakia. So we all spoke Slovak, Czech, German, and Hungarian, just like that. English, fine if you were educated, and French if you went to high school. So we, we all of us, I mean, I was too young to speak all those languages, but those were the languages which we all spoke in our own homes. Now, the other question you asked me, which was more relevant to me, was about my mother's languages, my mother's Red Cross letters. I only received about two or three Red Cross letters from my mother, and they were 25 words, as you said. But all those letters stopped uh, very soon after war started. And um, the main letter writer in our family that was left was my father. And my father wrote a letter to one of us three children, or his children, every week. 
but it went alternately, if I'm going to say you do alternate for three of us, and we would pass them round to each other. And we therefore had a letter every week, although it was only written to every third week, if you see what I'm saying. Yes. And um, we did have a problem when my brother died, we found quite, uh, we expected to find a lot of letters, but he destroyed everything. He didn't want anything to do with anything to do with Nazism. It's only then we discovered he must have had a certain amount of, uh, not dementia, but there was some mental problem, which he, he felt it too strongly. So I'm not quite sure whether he didn't censor what I got because I felt I was the baby sister and he had been given his instructions by my father when he left home that if anything happened to my parents, he should take on the responsibility. And he took that extremely seriously and he was a most wonderful brother all his life. But um, that's how it goes. But I have not yet given up on looking at the history of what happened to my mother. All I can believe is that she was a very sad lady. She'd lost her children. She was uh, separated from her husband. She then remarries a much older man who's sick. I mean, when I look back, even with the little knowledge that I've been able to glean, it must have been an extremely sad and hard time for her. But coming back to the question um, about my mother, she ends up with her second husband in a, a place uh, totally different from Bratislava. And she is befriended by the clergyman's wife uh, by the, uh, who had uh, baptized her. And it is she who wrote us a letter long after the end of the war, because she's been trying to let us know that she heard from mother as late as January, well, uh, January 45. And that she couldn't help us anymore after that. And mother had left quite a number of things with her. And unfortunately, most of the stuff had got stolen. But uh, it was a sad story. That, that is, that is, you, uh, your, um, the scarf that she gave you, right, at the, the train station, have I got that right? You, that's, that, that's uh, still in, that's in the Holocaust Center. And it's... I, I have still got some scarves which my mother actually packed for me. Hmm. And, uh, uh, they are very, very precious because obviously when you uh, can't take a great deal with you and I traveled with my mother's youngest sister and her child who then was four years older than I and uh, between us, we had seven pieces of luggage, so you can imagine <laughs> it's quite a journey. Absolutely, that's a lot of luggage. That's a story. That's a, a journey which should have taken one day, ended up taking four. Oh, no. Oh, no. For anyone that's ever caught a delayed flight or train before, that's a very long time. That is a long journey. Absolutely. I'm conscious of the time, everyone. I'm conscious of energy levels at this stage. Um, I wanted to ask a final question just to check in with both of you. How are you doing with coronavirus? Are you okay? Are both Ibi and, and Shruti, are you? Well, so far, so good, thank you. Good. <laughs> she wants to know how you are, Ibi. Managing, that's about it. I got living yeah. carers. And I couldn't manage otherwise. Yeah. Wow. Because I had a stroke in August and it slowed me down tremendously. Yes. I'm so sorry. I know we're we we um we're thinking of you always and we're so excited to have you both back in the center when it can reopen, is our hope. 
Um, you know, and so it's so very important. I know it's a pain to shield, but please do because you're precious to us and we want to see you back as soon as possible. So, so you can always put them on my website. Yes. Hey, I just jumping, I've just seen that I've got Alexander Woodall on, and he is the person who has helped me to do most of the work which I've been reporting to you. So thank you, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Well, I'm going to draw the evening to a close. I just want to thank Ibby, of course, Trudy, Tracy as well, who's in the background, for generously contributing uh, your time for this fascinating event, truly. And of course, to Alex, Joseph, for your fabulous technical skills. Thank you. We are grateful to everyone here for attending. As we said earlier, we're going to send out an email with a link to the recording and also a short online survey. Um, we have also shared the survey link in the chat. <laughs> so you can do it now if you want. We want your feedback. Our next HGRP event will be held on the 19th of April, this time hosted by the Wiener Holocaust Library. Dr. Anna Hayakova will be in conversation with Professor Dan Stone about her new book, The Last Ghetto and Everyday History of Theresienstadt. All of our events are free, but we are a charity, of course. So Alex is also going to shamelessly share the link it, to our Just Giving page once more in the chat. Remember, you can also follow us on social media or visit us in person from the 1st of June. Woo! So without further ado, thank you everyone for attending this evening. Thank you for contributing and thank you very much to our survivors for your talk. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.